Welcome back to Wild World of History, and this is the horrible history of Howard Zinn. Uh, today we're going to do a brief look at World War II. Let me begin with a caveat, which is, although I'm going to show you specific errors in the people's history uh, of the United States, uh, you can't go through the book and just pick out line after line of error and try to nitpick every error in the book because you aren't going to live that long. It, it would take you 50 lifetimes to find all the errors in this book. And one of the reasons is this is a deliberate tactic of leftists and Marxists, which is to pile on error after error after error into a kind of general argument so that you can't destroy the argument with a, a simple, well, you're, you're wrong here. This, uh, this under, you know, wipes out your whole argument. You can't do that. So really to, to attack a book like this and, and really defeat it, you have to understand that you're fighting against a, an approach to writing history that says, uh, that is based on Marxism, that basically moves you to a whole other playing field. The idea here for Zen and any leftist and any Marxist is to get you off the playing field of truth and fact and get you onto the playing field of, of basically feelings by heaping a whole bunch of unrelated facts together in a way that would seem to make their point. Now Marx in particular was very good about creating a whole new language. I've been over this in one of the other lessons, whole language of labor theory of value, reinvested dub, uh, dead substance, um, bourgeoisie, proletariat, um, all this kind of nonsense, class struggle. Um, you can't defeat these one at a time. I mean, you can, but what he wants to do is to completely move the playing field into a different arena. So in order to attack Marx <clears throat> or any of his goofball ideas, you have to uh, get on that playing field and really defeat the whole structure of Marxism, which is why I don't waste a whole lot of time debunking Marx. You just start with the labor theory of value, which is a wackadoodle goofball idea that nobody would uh, seriously would ever use, and yet it's the basis for all socialism, and certainly it's the basis for our friend Howard Zinn. So <clears throat> what I'm going to give you are just a, a few, very few um, examples from Zinn's book uh, in the chapter on uh, World War II. And again, his goal here is to uh, combine a whole bunch of rather unrelated stuff or unsupported stuff in a way that would make his broader point that the U.S. is horrible. Specifically in World War II, that the U.S. was no better than the Germans and the Japanese. So let's begin on page 411 of a people's history. <clears throat> and he's trying to make the argument that the United States provoked war with Japan. And he uses as part of his evidence the following. I'm just going to read you the passage. This is page 411. <clears throat> One of the judges in the Tokyo War Crimes trial after World War II, Rahadanad Pal, that's the guy's name, Rahadanad Pal, dissented from the general verdicts against the Japanese, that is, everybody else said the Japanese were guilty. But you got this one guy who said, oh, no, they're, they're not guilty. And he argued that the United States had clearly provoked the war with Japan and expected Japan to act. Then Zen says, Richard Menier, this is an author, and in parentheses he has a Victor's Justice, that is the book that Menier supposedly wrote. He doesn't give any publishing details or any page number sums up Powell's argument of the embargoes on scrap iron and oil, saying, quote, these measures were a clear and potent threat to Japan's very existence. Yeah, so they were meant to be. These measures came at the end of the 1930s after Japan had been running rampant in China, had been slaughtering Chinese civilians, had uh, engaged in what was called the Rape of Nanking, in which some 20,000 Chinese young men were lined up against walls outside Nanking and just machine gunned down, in which every woman in Nanking itself was raped, hence the term, the Rape of Nanking. <clears throat> so these measures that are a threat to Japan's existence came at the end of a whole bunch of measures 
in the 1930s, uh, various sanctions that Roosevelt was laying on the Japanese to get them to stop. Get out of China. You don't want the measures? It's easy. Easy solution. Get out of China. Stop killing Chinese. Stop killing Chinese people. Stop invading China. So it's absolutely preposterous that you would quote some goofball from the uh, war crimes, a dissenter who's trying to uh, claim that the United States provoked a war with Japan when these were the very last ditch measures that Roosevelt enacted hoping to save Chinese lives. I don't think anybody today would disagree with the measures that if you've got an, a potential enemy out there who's just slaughtering people and you're selling them stuff and giving them stuff, it might be wise, just, just spitballing here, but it might be wise not to sell them and give them implements of war or oil so they could keep killing people. But I guess that Zen's view is it's okay to kill Chinese if, if the United States is not provoking a war with Japan. The Japanese wanted the war. Their, their army especially overrode the Navy and said, you know, we're going to go into China. Now you figure out a way to take the United States out because we're going into China and we're not going to leave. So there was no question the Japanese wanted a war and they planned for a war with the United States for almost a year. You don't plan for a war against somebody and go on exercises if you're not planning to carry through with it. So that's our friend Zen on the entry into war. Let's go over a few more pages here. On page 417, Zen writes, World War II, quote, <clears throat> was a war waged by a government whose chief beneficiary, despite volumes of reforms, was a wealthy elite. So it's kind of funny here, despite volumes of reforms, he has to somehow praise Roosevelt. Oh, you know, R Roosevelt tried. There were volumes of reforms, but they didn't work, as you know, most of these reforms usually don't. But the other thing to realize is that the wealthy elite, they may have made a little money, but the biggest beneficiaries of World War II, almost all economists agree, were the American people. Um, you've heard it argued uh, that World War II got us out of the Depression. I think that's right, but I don't think for the same reasons that most historians do. Most of them are Keynesians who argue from a spending point of view, i.e., World War II caused us to spend our way out of the Great Depression. I don't think that's the case. It was a saving recession. And what happened was we saved our way out of the recession. And if you recall, you couldn't buy anything in World War II. I know most of you weren't alive then. But we had a thing called rationing. And you were rationed on meat, gasoline, sugar, tea, a whole coffee, a whole, whole range of things. Women were, you know, could not buy nylon stockings, for example. And uh, the uh, American public was getting paid. They were either in the Army, in, in the Marines, or working in factories. And they were getting paid. They got checks for four years, but they didn't have anything to spend it on. And so they just saved it. Many of them bought war bonds. Others just put it in, in savings. So when the war ended 1945, by early 1946, you have all these soldiers coming home. You have all these people who've been working for all these uh, years. And they have massive amounts of, of savings, lots of savings, and have not been able to spend at all in four years. And they're ready to have a party. They're ready to go spend. And so it shouldn't surprise you that the single most demanded item after World War II was a house. Home building just exploded after World War II because for the first time in American history, people had saved enough to actually afford a house uh, and certainly could afford one on, on minimal payments. Now, this was aided, admittedly, by the U.S. government and the uh, VA uh, bill, which gave uh, loans to veterans uh, when they wanted to buy a house. But nevertheless, you had to have the money in the first place, and, and they had it. Both the families and, and the veterans had it. The other thing to, to recognize about this is whatever you want to think about those wealthy elites, they were the ones who won the war. Without the Henry Kaisers, uh, without the um, uh, one trips, without the um, uh, Henry Fords, without the Andrew Jackson Higginses, um, 
you know, without Howard Hughes, without all these types of industrialists who've been harassed for eight years by Roosevelt's administration sending tax agents on them, auditing them all the time, regulating them, constantly berating them for not doing this or not doing that or doing too much of that, uh, codes to limit their profits. Now when Roosevelt needs them, he, he turns them loose. And there's a prophetic story that uh, Roosevelt called um, Henry Kaiser, who would build the vast majority of Liberty ships and said, Henry, I need you to make Liberty ships. Kaiser said, why? Why should I help you? You've done nothing but harass me for eight years. And, and Roosevelt <clears throat> basically said, forget what's happened before. We're going to take all those regulations off. And we're not going to tax you as much. So Kaiser ended up uh, building all the Liberty ships. And of course, as I said in a previous lesson, Andrew Jackson Higgins was the man who won the war because he built so many landing craft, <clears throat> let alone the, the, the guys who owned and ran Boeing and Lockheed and all these aircraft companies. You know, we built over 300,000 airplanes in four years of war. Those people were essential. They won the war. Paul Johnson, the great British historian, said the American businessman won World War II, not the Red Infantryman. And, you know, you might have an argument there, but certainly the Red Army couldn't have done what it did without all of those free jeeps and tanks and trucks that were just pouring into Russia for about two years there at the early part of the war. So that's Zinn getting in his little dig against the people who actually won the war. Let's go to just one more here. Uh, this is the old canard that Japan would have surrendered without the atomic bomb. And at the bottom of page 422, Zen says, <clears throat> and he's quoting the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, based on a detailed investigation of all the facts and supported by the testimony of surviving Japanese leaders involved, it is the survey's opinion that certainly prior to December 31, 1945, and in all probability prior to November 1, 1945, Japan would have surrendered even if the atomic bombs had not been dropped. You might want to tell that to the Japanese leader. Um, a uh, Japanese historian named Asada has gotten into all of the World War II Japanese archives of, of the government that was in operation at the time. And what he found with the War Council after the first bomb was dropped was they were in no mood to surrender. They weren't even thinking about surrender after being hit with an atomic bomb. Prior to that, Asada said that they weren't even considering surrender. They were going to hold on till the bitter end. And what gave them confidence that they could do that was uh, the very bloody taking of the island of Okinawa. That was incredibly uh, bloody for the United States, costly. Uh, we had very severe casualties had a number of ships sunk by kamikazes uh, far more than any other time during the war. <clears throat> and that gave many American leaders a great pause in saying, we're going to replicate Okinawa maybe 10 or 12 times in invading the home islands of Japan. That's going to cost us a lot. And, and so the conclusion by Asada, the conclusion by virtually every other, uh, Richard B. Frank and others, um, is that the invasion of Japan um, was, as far as we had planned it, underestimating the amount of re uh, resistance. A guy named uh, Jean Greco did a study in which he found that the army's plans had not even taken into account the weather, had not taken into account two extra divisions, that's about 40,000 men that had been moved into uh, the Japanese islands from China, uh, had not taken into account a lot of the roads, which would be impassable. Um, in short, uh, and oh, and by the way, those were just the estimates, were just the Army and Marines. They did not include air and naval losses. And those estimates were that should the U.S. actually have invaded Japan, it would have cost us about a million casualties and perhaps as many as 10 million Japanese casualties. Um, so when you look at it from that perspective, the atomic bomb saved tremendous numbers of lives, both American and 
Japanese. Um, <clears throat> and largely, it wasn't just the destructive power of the bombs, it was Truman and, and uh, the, the generals and Admiral Nimitz and others pretending that we had arsenals of these bombs, that we could drop one a day for the rest of the year if we wanted to. And the fact was, we only had two more bombs in the pipeline and they were over a month out. We, we could not drop any more bombs right away. So it was kind of a gamble that we would convince the Japanese that we're going to do this to you every day if you don't surrender. And, and they, after the second one, Asada reported that there was still almost a 50-50 split and the emperor had to weigh in. He said, no, dudes, we're surrendering. This is ridiculous. There won't be a Japan left if you don't surrender right now. So once again, just taking up three of these uh, ridiculous uh, small, small passages from Zen shows you that this book is absolutely not to be relied on at all. This is Larry Swigart for The Wild World of History.